Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome to the Duocast slash recap. It's good to connect with you, my friend. Brian, as usual, I'm happy to be here, happy to be alive. It's just an all-out good thing that you and I get to get together and talk and recap and do whatever we want. When I was a barista, (laughs) there was a man that would come by. I was slinging lattes back in the early 90s. Right. And this man would say, I'd say, how's it going? And he would say, I woke up on the green side of the grass. That's all I can ask for. There you go. And it's kind of how I feel today. Yeah. That's a good concept. And then you have the uh, Jimi Hendrix lyric, woke up this morning and found myself dead. So, you know, those are the two extremes that I think <laughs> that I think about. <laughs> so I like to look at the Jim Morrison point of view. Woke up this morning and got myself a beer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That, that's actually a great lyric. And, and the music that it was set to was fun too. That, that's a song I haven't listened to in a long time. Yeah. I recommend it. Roadhouse Blues. Mm -hmm. Is that where he sings, Mr. Mojo Rising? Or is that a different song? That's uh, L.A. Woman. L.A. Woman. Okay. That's another good one. Yeah. Classics. Classics. We're here to recap two episodes. We had Amber Seeley, which launched on our regular schedule last week, Mm -hmm. and Michele Civetta. Yeah. I cannot help but speak in an Italian accent um, when I say his name, because it's such a cool fucking name, Michele Civetta. Yeah. Is that racist to say Michele Civetta? Like to actually put I don't think so. an accent on it? I don't think so. Okay. I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't know. All right. Well, maybe, uh, maybe our listeners could chime in and say whether it is or not. I, I don't. I find myself doing Italian accents once in a while too, except for mine are more New York Italian and they're usually profanity laced. Uh-huh. Well, that's racist. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, now we know. <laughs> no, it's not. Now we know you're a racist. I don't know what it is. No. No, not? my kids, I'm sure if I if I uh, ask my kids, they'll tell me if that's not woke or, uh, you know, not woke enough. Right. But going back to Amber Seeley, let's talk about Amber. Okay. She is the director of a movie called No Man of God, starring Elijah Wood, Luke Kirby, Robert Patrick. Mm. And I think I've already raved about this film yeah. on a prior duo cast. And I have Oscar nomination predictions and uh, Golden Globe predictions. It's it's going to be recognized in award season somehow. And uh, I, I just really enjoyed talking to Amber. I was just emailing with her just a few minutes ago about the launch of her episode and thanking her for sharing on social media about her interview on the podcast. Yeah, I saw that. There's just certain guests that I feel a special connection to, and Amber is one of them. I really appreciated not just her discussion and perspective on the film, the Bundy film, and why it's different from the rest, why it's important, Mm -hmm. but she had a pretty important perspective on how filmmakers, and especially older female filmmakers, can break into the business and tips on how to approach getting started creatively in film. Right. You probably noticed over the last several months, there's been a common denominator with questions I asked toward the end of these interviews. And a lot of these questions are geared toward how do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. Because I I just have a natural curiosity about it and fascination and complete admiration for creatives that are able to get into this space, have the courage to do it. Amber did it from a very early age. She was encouraged by her parents to do things creatively, made her way into acting and then into directing. And I just really enjoyed talking to her. Look forward to following her career after this movie. But um, I know you haven't had a chance to see No Man of God yet, but not yet. when it's available to rent, check it out. I think Odessa would enjoy it as well. Oh yeah. We've talked about it. We've talked about watching it. Nice. You know, she, she noticed too, you know, looking at Luke Kirby's role as Ted that, uh, Man, he pulls it off so well. Just the mannerisms, everything, you know, the way he holds himself, the way he sits, it's it's really uncanny. There's this certain look that he has Mm -hmm. that he gives Elijah Wood's character, who plays Special Agent Bill Hagmeyer. Yeah. uh, where he's looking he's kind of looking down and then he his his head is facing down or his face is down, but his eyes are kind of peeking up. 
Yeah. And it's this creepy, animalistic look that he has toward Elijah's character. Yeah, totally. I was totally creeped out by Luke Kirby, but also captivated too. He's a very handsome dude. Oh, yeah. Very smooth and eloquent. And I think captures the essence of Bundy. Totally. We've talked about Bundy being a, a charismatic dude who, who kind of has this really dangerous mix of good looks and charisma. And also, he's a psychopath. Yeah. That's exactly what I saw in Kirby. I'm like, oof, man, that guy's a little too good. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fun interview. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I'm finding, I think that we're both finding uh, the takeaways at the end of these interviews with these creatives is to just go out there and make the content. Do, you know, go out and do it. You know, you can create shorts and put them out on YouTube. You can do things on TikTok. That's what a lot of people are doing nowadays. Just make the content, you know, do what you want to make. And yeah, you know, I know it's easier for some, you know, easier said than done, but that's kind of the takeaways I'm hearing a lot of times from these guys is that just go out and make it. I agree, Jason. I am a part of uh, filmmaker Facebook groups and screenwriting Facebook groups and a lot of folks that are basically trying to break into the business, learn the business. And there seems to be a lot of people out there that love to talk about doing things that are creative, that love to talk about writing, yeah, talk about the process. And the people that are actually doing it aren't talking about it. Right. That's something they dealt with years ago. Uh -huh. They're more concerned with doing. And it's the old Nike slogan, just do it. Right. There's a lot of barriers to entry into film, but the folks that are successful don't think about those barriers. They just look for opportunities to make something. And even if it's just with their iPhone yeah. or TikTok, how do you create? without being concerned about those barriers. You know, what is the psychology there? That's part of this journey that you and I are on with the podcast is mm -hmm. exploring that with creatives and looking for those common denominators and those common threads between successful creatives. Yeah, absolutely. So what did you think of the Michele Civetta interview? <laughs> Same thing. It's like a, a, another creative that has just found himself having some success with these films. He's just, he's kind of had the same message about going out and just getting it done. But, um, I haven't had a chance to watch that movie either, uh, The Gateway, uh, but it looks to me like a scary movie, really. I mean, it's kind of this rogue social worker guy that's really trying to protect this one particular family. I think that's what the premise of the film is. And, you know, the guy gets out of jail early and gets sucked back into the crime world and just turns everything upside down. And this guy is kind of out there fighting this battle. And it looks like a really great film. And the actor, a lot of the actors in it are really good actors. Yeah, Bruce Dern is in it. That was kind of surprising. Yeah. Bruce Dern is, you know, I think one of the greatest character actors of the last 50 years. Oh, yeah. A wide range of films that he's done, and uh, to see him show up in this movie was pretty cool. And also Shea Wiggum. I love Shea Wiggum from Boardwalk Empire. Yep. I got to meet Shea at Sundance Film Festival, just a chance meeting in an elevator. We stayed in the same building, but nice very nice guy and affable and and gracious he does a great job as a leading man you don't see shay doing leading man work too often in movies he plays supporting roles a lot but i think he did a great job as a leading man as a leading actor in this film and really carried the movie from start to finish it's a lot of fun it's a completely different film than it's probably the most diametrically opposed film to no man of god mm. that you can get in terms of uh, no Man of God is very contained. It was shot during the pandemic. Yeah. It all takes place, or a lot of it takes place in one room. It's just an interview between Hagmeyer and Bundy, mm -hmm. Elijah Wood's character and Luke Kirby. And The Gateway was shot before the pandemic and wrapped right before the pandemic started. And it was shot in uh, Virginia. Right. And there's just a lot of action and shoot 'em up scenes and just a way different vibe. A way different film. Yeah, I noticed that, yeah. But both really well worth watching and going out and seeing before they hit uh, the free streaming services. So go out and rent them, check them out, let me know what you think. And, uh, you know, it'd be fun to actually receive some comments from viewers or emails about what they think about these films or on social media and, you know, tag me in a post about it and we can talk about it or debate it. But yeah, this is part of the process that I really love, which is 
the research and the homework. And how often do you get a homework assignment where you actually have to watch a movie? And that's it. <laughs> watch this movie. Yes. <laughs> of course, my research is a lot more in depth than just watching a movie. I have to go back and watch other films that the director has done, read other interviews, watch other interviews. And that's how I approach these conversations because I don't want to cover what other people have done. Right. And I want this conversation to feel new and fresh, not just to my listeners, but also to the guest so that they feel like it was worth their time. And that's what I tried to do with McKelly and Amber here. You did a wonderful job. You really did. Thanks, brother. We have some pretty fun news to report. Okay. A prior guest, her name is Jess Brunetto. Oh, yeah. She is the writer and director of a short film that made it into South by Southwest and other film festivals called Sisters. That's right. And that was a great short film. And I don't say that often about short films because it's just really hard to make good, compelling, funny short films. But she did it. Right on. And hit it out of the park. But we talked to her a few months ago. I didn't realize it at the time, but she was doing some editing work on a show called Hacks, hmm. which is on HBO. Okay. And just recently was nominated for an Emmy. What? Wow. For her editing work on that show. Nice. Yeah. So Emmy nominated uh, editor, Jess Brunetto. If you want to go back and listen to that interview, check it out. We're going to follow that awards show and see what happens and see if Jess is able to pick up an Emmy. And even if she doesn't, just the nomination itself is a huge honor and kudos to Jess for picking up that nomination. Absolutely. Congratulations. Um, it'd be nice to touch base with her again, see how she's doing. And hopefully she'll have an Emmy to talk about. That would be great. So more news, Jason, before we move on to what's next and wrapping up. You may have seen some social media posts that I've done recently about Helium Network. Oh, yeah. Helium will be running episodes of Dream Path Podcast on their internet radio station. Nice. Every Saturday at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific, there will be a new episode of Dream Path Podcast running. And when I say new, I use that term loosely because they are starting from the beginning. They're going back to older episodes and they're going to run a new episode every week until they're caught up. And we're not going to play every single episode because I think they have to be an hour or less. And many of my interviews, especially toward the beginning, were quite lengthy. Some of them were hour and 15 minutes, hour and 30 minutes. Yeah. So we'll see which ones they decide to run. But I am honored and super excited to have Dream Path Podcast on a new platform like internet radio. I've never been part of something like that before. I'm sure it's going to be a new audience and we're going to have engagement from new listeners and going to be building this Dream Path community that way. That's amazing. Yeah, I've heard about Helium Network or Helium Radio, and I think this is a fantastic opportunity for you, a fantastic opportunity for both of us. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the results of that and even listening in. I don't, I don't mind listening. You know, it's, it's, to, me, it's, <laughs> to me, it's part of our history, dude. You know, it's our legacy, man. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's neat to go back and listen to older episodes and see how the show has evolved. Oh, yeah. And uh, how we switch things up with the intro and the mid-roll and the outro. And yep. the sound has always been amazing because of you, Jason. You've done great work on the audio. <laughs> but in terms of my approach to interviews, and it is interesting to go back every once in a while and just kind of see how it's changed and how it's evolved. Absolutely, yeah. You were texting me the other day saying, what's going on? You know, what kind of content do we have lined up for October? So I wanted mm -hmm. to share with you and, and the listeners that, uh, of course, we have a couple of interviews that are in the can, so to speak. We have already recorded an interview with a musician by the name of Jeff Fielder out of Seattle. Nice. He is a side man. He's a front man. He's a songwriter. He has an album from 2006 called The Last Disguise, which is awesome, by the way. You should check it out. Okay. He has a new album out with his wife, whose name is Tecla Waterfield, and it's kind of a folk album, kind of folksy. It sounds a little bit like Cowboy Junkies, or at least inspired by perhaps a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Pretty mellow, but also has some catchy tunes as well. You know, I'm not very good at music criticism, so it's kind of like uh, wine. If you put wine in front of me, a red wine and a white wine, I'm... <laughs> 
I'm going to describe it as either good or bad. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to tell you if there's uh, notes of oak or cherry in those glasses of wine. <laughs> Same thing with music. I either like it or I don't. And I really liked Jeff and Tecla's uh, new album that's uh, out this year, actually. But I had fun talking to Jeff about his career. And, you know, Jeff has worked with some amazing musicians over the last 20 years mm -hmm. and has a lot of fun stories to tell about his journey into music. And as you know, I got to see him live with Al Johannes a couple weeks ago. That's right. And that made for, you know, a little more interesting conversation because I got a chance to see him right before we spoke. And then another interview we have in the can is a director, a film director by the name of Rebecca Eskries. Cool. And she directed a movie called What Breaks the Ice. Hmm. And What Breaks the Ice is kind of a crime thriller, kind of a relationship movie. It's hard to describe exactly what it is, but it's set in the summer of 1998. So it's an interesting era to cover, mm -hmm. kind of the end of Bill Clinton's, toward the end of Bill Clinton's presidency. And that was referenced, his impeachment was referenced, Monica Lewinsky was referenced and oh, yeah. throughout the film a couple of times to give you a sense of what era we're in when we're watching it. Yep. It stars Madeline Klein, Lucas Gage, Sophia Hublitz, and uh, great actors, by the way. And, and it's you know a movie I watched with Isabel, my youngest daughter. And it was fun to watch a movie with her when there are themes in the movie that have to do with consent, that have to do with revenge. And, you know, there's a different perspective that young folks provide on certain issues. It's fun to process those questions with younger people when you're watching movies like this. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to Rebecca a little bit about that and shared that I did watch the movie with my youngest and it made for a great conversation. So looking forward to launching that interview in early October. Uh, when the the film launches, I think it's going to premiere in early October sometime. So we're going to time the launch of that episode with the launch of the film. Very cool. Very cool. Looking forward to that, actually. Um, you know, I'm actually pretty excited for the interview with Jeff Fielder. You had sent me a link to a YouTube video that was actually the concert that you went to. And I think there's one or two songs by him up there. The one that really caught my ear was a version of Mark Lanigan's 100 Days. Mm -hmm. That is so good. Yeah. Yeah. He toured with Mark Lanigan for years and has recorded with him. And Mark Lanigan, I think, you know, you and I both share uh, a lot of love and reverence for Mark Lanigan, consider him to be one of the Pacific Northwest mm. legends. Absolutely. Musically. Yep. Anyone who is so closely tied to Mark and his musical history is someone I'm fascinated to talk to. And Jeff is one of those people. Yeah. Mark Lanigan. Wow. Jeff is a guy who. He refers to himself as the Forrest Gump of rock and roll. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, you and I were chuckling about that. But when I was doing research for the interview, I stumbled across a 2016 documentary on Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses. Oh, yeah. And look who pops up in the movie. Like in the first 10 seconds of the film, it's a concert <laughs> movie a little bit. You know, there's Jeff Fielder playing, <laughs> playing guitar. Right next to Duff McKagan at the Paramount or some, you know, some theater in Seattle. Right on. And it's true. This guy just pops up everywhere. And it's because every rock legend in the Seattle area, frankly, across the country, considers Jeff to be an amazing guitarist, number one. Number two, completely reliable, someone you can trust to provide everything that's needed in terms of support on stage, performing live or recording. He tours with uh, Indigo Girls and specifically with Amy Ray and her solo act, which I love because I love the Indigo Girls and I love Amy Ray. Oh, yeah. So we're rambling on and on about Jeff Fielder for a good reason. He's uh, just an incredible guy, an incredible musician, and it was a fun chat. Yeah, yeah. I, I listened to some of it and started editing, and it, it's a really good interview. I was glad that he sent that wave file of his audio, so it's going to sound like we're in the same room together. Yeah, it's very, very smooth. Right on. Hey, um, before we wrap up, I kind of want to make uh, a statement, I guess, an apology maybe for comments that I made about Keith Richards in the last duo cast. Uh, we were talking about Charlie Watts and his passing, and I was kind of jokingly sort of pointing at Keith Richards like, you know, what the heck, this guy's still, still kicking, you know, but uh, I didn't mean any disrespect about it, and I haven't gotten any comments or anything about it. I just wanted to come out and say that, um, 
you know, I don't think that's right. I don't think it was right to to really make make fun of uh, Keith. He's always been like over the last few decades, kind of the butt of jokes when it comes to like health or sobriety or whatever. And people make fun of him, kind of like people do with Ozzy Osbourne. You know, they just kind of tend to make fun of him uh, because they've pretty much wrecked their bodies and or whatever just over the years of drug abuse and things like that. So there's a couple of factors, you know, as far as Charlie Watts. First of all, Charlie was older than all the rest of them. He was about five years older than Mick and Keith. So, you know, he was older and he just had a medical procedure done. You know, the older you get, these medical procedures, surgeries, whatever, they become more risky. So there's that factor. Uh, I also saw an interview with Charlie Watts, 60 Minutes interview, where he talked about his struggles with heroin addiction and alcoholism. And so it kind of made me feel bad because he too dealt with that stuff too. It wasn't just Keith Richards in the band that was using drugs. And and I think that was a, just a common thing in the 60s and 70s to, you know, experiment with these kinds of things. And so he had his own struggles. So I just wanted to say that I wasn't really trying to poke fun at Keith Richards. I mean, it's amazing that these guys made it as long as they did, you know, but uh, I hope they, I hope they can continue on and I, I won't make fun of Keith Richards anymore. <laughs> well, you know, let me say this. You're still going to hell. So that's not <laughs> really changing. Oh. But I appreciate the effort and I'm sure God does too. So, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe he'll let you slide in. No, no, but, there's too many other n- things. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. It's, it's nice of you and sensitive of you to reflect back on statements that you've made. But I, I think between you and I, we've probably stumbled a few times over the years when we try to make jokes about things that maybe we shouldn't or make light of things that we shouldn't. Right. But I still don't think that your statements were insensitive. But hey, there's no harm in going back and thinking about and rethinking you know, comments that you've made and trying to be a more sensitive, woke, kind, and caring person. So that's what I love about you, Jason. Well, I appreciate that. I just didn't think it was right. I mean, of course, we're going to, uh, throughout time, people have, like I said, he's always been the butt of jokes when it comes to those sorts of behaviors and things like that. And when actually, <laughs> probably the majority of the people that were in bands in the 60s and 70s had had a brush with drug use of some sort. So those types of drugs are not to really screw with. They're very addictive. And Charlie dealt with it too. So, you know, and John Lennon dealt with it. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, famous musicians, you know, Jerry Garcia got hooked on heroin. So it's not just Keith. Speaking of drug addiction and, you know, struggles with addiction, Michael K. Williams, I wasn't intending to talk about this on the dual cast today because I didn't want to make it too long, but Michael K. Williams from The Wire and a lot of other wonderful TV projects and films, I think he was 54 years old this week. Mm -hmm. when he passed away from what appears to be an accidental drug overdose. We don't know yet. Oh, man. But Michael K. Williams was a fantastic actor and an even uh, more amazing human being. I listened to his interview with Mark Maron. Mm. I think it was this year even. He openly talked about his struggles with addiction. And I think his quote on the podcast and in other interviews was that he deals with it every single day. And folks that are recovering addicts and alcoholics like Keith Richards, like Charlie Watts, like anyone who has struggled with addiction are fighting a battle that nobody knows anything about. Yep. And, and maybe that's overstating it a little bit because other addicts know what that battle is about. Oh, yeah. It's really devastating to lose someone like Michael K. Williams at the age of 54. It's a gift to be able to make it all the way to 80 or to 75 or however old Keith Richards is now. But um, it is no joke. No. It really isn't. Addiction is not a laughing matter. Not at all. So thank you for those comments. And and it kind of triggered that memory of Michael K. Williams passing. And it's a good thing to talk about and a good thing to process together. Yeah, I agree. You know, and, and coming from somebody like me also, I wouldn't consider myself an addict. I over the years, it took me a couple of decades to grow up, basically. <laughs> I've, you know, uh, had a bit of a struggle with drinking a couple of times. So I shouldn't be making fun of anybody that has a problem at all. And just, uh, it just kind of made me realize look, I don't, it's not my place. I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> I think you've said everything that you need to say about it, and I appreciate it. 
I will look forward to more conversations and jokes about uh, whatever we want to talk about in the future. And we will do so with uh, caution and uh, sensitivity because I think you and I are both evolving human beings who are trying to grow and learn and just be better people every time you know we wake up on the green side of the grass. Yep. I'm thankful for it every day, man. Right on, brother. Well, it's good connecting with you, my friend. It's good connecting with you too. I appreciate it. Thank you. Until next time. Have a great weekend. You too. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. Thank you.